Welcome to Yin and Yang. The following is a story taken from Chapter 2. I have called it, What Happened to Your Feet, Nai Nai? I hope you enjoy it. One dark afternoon, an army truck pulled up to the front of the house, and Qianlong got out of the passenger side, going to the back. Another younger soldier followed him out, and a second one got out from behind the driver's seat. Both the younger soldiers quickly ran behind the truck and undid the cloth cover, releasing the flap to reveal a metal drum-shaped oven, which the two soldiers lowered down and carried with grunts and directives such as, Here, 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 or careful. Meanwhile, Ju Yu stood at the door with her eyes wide, asking, What's going on? What are you doing? Yin Lin clung to her mother, as the two men paused at the opened front door, nodding their greetings to Yinlin and her mother. Winter entered their home, as Yinlin's father and another soldier placed a large wooden pad on the floor. Then the other two men carried the oven through the door and set it down in the corner immediately to their left. Good, good, Qianlong said, patting one man on the back. Qianlong seemed unusually friendly to the men, perhaps because they were under the shelter of his home or because they had done him a special favor. They saluted at the door and were soon back on the road, grinding the truck into gear, heading forward and out of sight. The metal drum was cold, and it took many hours for Yinlin's father to mount it securely to the floor and set up a system of exhaust. The room was especially cold as he had to vent the stove outside, and this meant allowing cold air to come in. It had long been dark by the time the work was finished, and Qianlong gathered some bits of old paper and slivers of wood he had already gathered for this purpose, and soon had a small fire going. Yinlin and her mother both watched. The smell of wood and paper burning in the house was unusual. The fire was small, having little effect on the temperature of the stove, but the sharp edge of cold had visibly disappeared from the metal. Qianlong stepped out of the house for a moment as Yinlin snuck a peek into the door of the stove. Stay away from there, Ju Yu said. But she too was intrigued. None of her neighbors had such a thing in their home. It would bring a permanent change to the conditions they lived under in the cold Shanghai winters. Qianlong returned to the house with a large metal pail full of black coal shards. He hunched down and quickly tossed a number of coals into the stove, then blew air into the door for several minutes. Satisfied, he closed the door of the stove, then adjusted a few vents, opening holes near the surface. Finally he sat, and as Yinlin reached out to touch the stove, quickly but gently, Qianlong grabbed hold of her arm and said, No, daughter, that metal is going to get quite hot, you see. He drew her closer. Even from here you can already feel the warmth, right? But if you touch that metal, you will get burned. It will be very painful. You must promise me not to touch this stove when there is a fire inside. Ju Yu brought Qianlong a cup of tea, then rounded up some food for dinner. Qianlong rested from his work, satisfied that he had brought warm goodness into the home for everyone. Yinlin stood in front of the stove. My father is so wonderful, she thought. She held her hands toward the heat and stared at her father, who stared out the window. The stove became a new centerpiece in the home. It was used for cooking as well as heating the main room and even the bedrooms. During the winter, the coals of the stove were always kept alive until morning when they were reignited for breakfast and water for washing. By the warmth of this stove, many family conversations and events took place, and Wu Wen, affectionately called Nai Nai after Yinlin was born, could sit comfortably. It was by this stove that Yinlin would often sit and play and talk with her grandmother, especially when Ju Yu was out doing her marches. 
Ju Yu often told Yinlin that she was a child and should not ask so many questions. But Yinlin was an intelligent girl who was quickly learning about her world. What happened to your feet, Nai Nai? Why Nai Nai was slow to speak is unclear. Perhaps it was age. But more likely it was resistance. Silent, dignified resistance. This was a time in the history of her people that her countrymen were campaigning to rid themselves of the four olds, old ideas, culture, habits, and customs. This social movement occurred after the great damage that the Red Guard, called the Hongwei Bing, had already inflicted upon their society. In the name of protecting Mao Zedong, the Red Guard took away anything that insulted the great leader, or perhaps, say, threaten his power. Capitalism was considered an enemy. Many capitalist bosses were put to public shame for their crimes, sent away to work as laborers, imprisoned or killed. Once elegant and costly homes such as hers were converted into Communist Party offices or barns for raising chickens and pigs. The old history the old life that her countrymen tried to destroy was the only life she knew. Now she sat in a dark room beside a warm stove. It was hardly surprising that she had little to share with a world that had already closed in all around her. But Yinlin's questioning spirit, her childlike innocence, brought Nai Nai a sense of hope. Nai Nai? Why are your feet different from other people? Were you born like that? In my family, she said quietly, girls were more admired if they had small feet. Nai Nai sat like the matron she was. Her face was light-skinned and smooth. Her eyes looked sad. Really? Why? Nai Nai raised her feet a little, displaying her navy blue silk covered feet. Don't you think these are beautiful? Yinlin did admire the silk booties her grandmother wore, but she had seen her grandmother's feet. They looked like claws. Her actual feet did not look beautiful. But when they were covered in silk, yes, she thought they were beautiful. Yinlin nodded and smiled up at Nai Nai. Yinlin wondered how she could get her feet to be like her grandmother's, so she asked, If I wear shoes like that, do you think I can have small feet too? Her grandmother looked down and shook her head slightly. No. How can I get feet like yours, Nai Nai? This is not allowed anymore, granddaughter. Tell me, Nai Nai, tell me. When I was young, I was made to soak my feet in a special mixture of spices and animal blood. Yes, is that all? After soaking my feet, then one of my father's workers came and pressed my toes under my foot until you could hear them crack. Crack? What do you mean? Yinlin hesitated. Is it painful? Yes, Yinlin, it was painful. Sometimes it was so painful. How come? If it is painful, why did you do it? You do it to show your devotion. If you want to be a good wife, you do this procedure. The women or girls who are afraid of this pain don't make good wives. Does that mean Mum is not a good wife? Yinlin asked. As I said, Yinlin, it is not allowed to make these beautiful feet anymore. We live in a different world now. Yinlin was quiet for a little while. Hot air could be heard moving in the stove. 
Yinlin looked at her grandmother. She was wearing a navy blue outfit designed according to the old manner. It had no buttons and it wrapped around the body. Underneath was a more intimate layer of white. But that white undercloth extended out of the wrap as a high collar around the neck. This traditional fashion is seen in paintings of times past. It stood in elegant contrast to the long sleeve button up shirts that both women and men now wear. Nai Nai was a living embodiment of old China, hidden away in the house of her daughter. Is that why your clothes are different also? Yes. I want to have that kind of dress. Yinlin said. Do you like Nai Nai's dress? Yes, Yinlin said. She really did admire it. It is beautiful, isn't it? Nai Nai began to lose track of her age as she opened up to her granddaughter. I don't know where you can find such clothes anymore. Even the cloth cannot be found. Why? Yinlin was disappointed. She wanted to have this kind of shiny blue cloth also. Now is not the time for such clothes, Yinlin. Even your mother, who works so hard to find good cloth from the recycling store, can only collect small pieces in a basket. But if you like, I can show you something else. Yinlin's ears perked up. What would her nine eyes show her? It is very beautiful, but you have to go to my bed and get it. It is in the drawer, just near my pillow. Yinlin went to the room where she and her Nai Nai slept. The middle room was like an antechamber. You had to pass through this room to get to Tianlong and Zhu Yu's bedroom. Walking through the room, there was a wall of shelves and drawers, the basket of cloth Nai Nai mentioned and various oddments behind you as you passed through the door. Nai Nai's bed was straight ahead in the back corner. It was made of Hong Mu, a rare species of rosewood. It was done in the old style, enclosed all around, with an opening on the side facing the door to the eating area and the stove. It was like the opening of a stage, and had a curtain, or, in the summers, a mosquito net that could be drawn shut. Often the curtain was pulled back, and you could see the old but still elegant silks covering the mat and pillows. The entire surface of the bed frame was carved, both inside the enclosure and out, on panels as well as drawers and pillars. Where there was a wooden surface, there was carving. On the outside, at the foot of the bed, was a scene of two ducks playing with a lotus. This was intended as a wish for a fulfilling and long-lasting marriage. Other scenes all around the outside of the bed represented episodes from the classic novel Dream of the Red Chamber. On the inside of the bed, including all along the surface of the canopy of the bed, were carvings of one hundred children. Some scenes had children playing and having fun, sometimes reading other children being taught by a tutor. Such a bed was thought to be blessed. One hundred children carved in the bed meant you will have lots of offspring. Yinlin often wondered why her grandmother's bed was so different from usual people. All the other beds that Yinlin ever saw were the same light brown color of her parents' bed and usually had no head or footboard. Compared to her grandmother's wooden, heavy-as-concrete bed, the others were quite unsubstantial. Yinlin passed many mornings or afternoons playing inside the enclosure of her grandmother's bed, looking at the little carvings of children and making up stories for each of them. She animated the characters with voices and reached to touch the human figures and plants. She also traced the Chinese language characters with her fingers, or looked inside the various drawers and pockets hidden away in different places. Some drawers were secret, carved so delicately that it was not easy to see the way to pull it open.
Yin then went to the drawer that Nai Nai directed her to. It was below the pillow and was the first of twelve drawers, each with an image from the Chinese zodiac. This drawer at the front of the row had an image of a rat, and the rat was holding a sack representing the wealth it had gathered. The sack was the knob that Yinlin pulled to open the drawer. As Yinlin pulled on the drawer, she found old buttons and string, a small bottle of perfume that had mostly dried, and a small silk pouch. It was black and had a drawstring. Yinlin pulled out the purse and felt it. It was soft, and there was something heavy inside. Outside the room, Nai Nai asked in a barely audible voice, Did you see the small purse inside? Yinlin replied that she had. Bring it to me. Let's have a look. Yinlin closed the drawer and brought the purse to her grandmother. Nai Nai placed the purse on her lap and opened the top. She slid the contents into the palm of her hand. Something long came out, but it was wrapped in cotton as if sleeping in a bed. Unwrap it, Nanai said to Yinlin, carefully. Yinlin delicately pulled the top surface of cotton away to reveal a dark green jade object. Yinlin leaned against Nanai's leg. Nai Nai said, you see, hold it out in the light where we can both admire it. Nai Nai lifted herself slightly in her chair and looked to the object in Yinlin's hands. She said, yes. There was a pause, and then she rested back in the chair. Silently, Yinlin's grandmother found a cloth from somewhere and wiped her eyes. Nai Nai often wiped her eyes and claimed that the cold made them runny. Put it here, Nai Nai pointed to her lap. Do you know what this is? Yinlin shook her head. As Yinlin gently touched the object before her, Nai Nai explained, This carved jade was the centerpiece of my wedding headdress. These birds are cranes, and to the Chinese it represents long-lasting love and loyalty in marriage. Hold it, Yinlin. What do you think? Nai Nai asked. Do you think it is heavy or light? Yinlin held it a little, observing it carefully. The object was longer than her small hands, but thinly carved. Even so, it was heavy. Yinlin marveled at it. Like the carvings on the bed, the image told a story. She ran her fingers along the cranes who were made to look as if they were building a nest. The jade was in an oval shape and would have rested on the forehead of the bride. Something in this object spoke to Yinlin, not just of riches, but deep wealth. Wealth that was more than money. This piece of green jade looked to her not only like a messenger of the past, but a messenger from the heart of the earth. Of course, she was too young to articulate the feeling in such words, but it is often the case that children know more than they can tell. Then after a few moments, Nai Nai spoke again. It is such a pity that people took the headdress away. It was one of a kind, nothing else like it, each stone carved by hand, and it was designed with such care, using very rare materials. Do you understand? This is the value of the hairpiece. But the people who took it away could see no value in it at all. Everything of beauty they tried to destroy. From this talking, Yinlin understood that her grandmother did not agree with the Hongwei Bing. 
She did not agree with the colors of the clothing people wore. Her bed was different, expensive. Actually, it was a shame to have such an expensive bed, so different from everyone else. But her Nainai seemed as unwilling to move as that heavy bed with all its stories and magic of the past. Nainai told her to return the jade to the drawer so that it would not be lost.